We are FBC Summit, leading everyday people to love Jesus and make Him known. Thank you so much for joining us today. Here's our pastor, Dr. Larry LeBlanc. Would you take your Bible and turn to those very words that Aaron just got so beautiful through beautifully singing Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 this morning, we are going to be continuing our journey through this glorious Bible book. We're going to be in verses 8 through 17 of the first chapter this morning, and I have titled the message this morning, FOTU, F-O-T-U. And that is an acronym for what I want our church to be. It's what I want you to be and what I want I to be, want, want I, me and you both to embrace this. And what this stands for is the fellowship of the unashamed. The fellowship of the unashamed. I want to read you something today, and I, I want this to set our time together. This is reported to have been written by Bob Moorhead years ago. And it says, it summarizes that creed. He said, I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My, presence makes, my present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, mundane talky, talking, chintzy giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, positions, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by presence. Presence, learn by faith, love by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by power. My pace is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions few, my God reliable, my mission clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, of the enemy ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, back up, lit up, or shut up until I've preached up, prayed up, paid up, stored up, and stayed up for the cause of Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go until he returns, give until I drop, preach until all know, and work until he comes. And when he comes to get his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My colors will be clear, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Amen. That is what it means to be a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. So even as we begin our study and our time together today, I would ask you, can you say unequivocally that you are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? In these verses that we just see last week, we studied the first seven verses, and today you're going to see in these few verses that Paul wrote to the Romans because he cared for their spiritual maturity and so far, he had been prevented from ever getting to meet them, from, from being able to come to them. And so you see in these few verses the heart of the Apostle Paul. You see his heart per poured out. And in that heart, we learn a very valuable lesson because in these few verses, we are going to learn what are the essentials for godly ministry for individual ministry, for a church ministry, for anyone to live a godly life of ministry. What are the essentials? So I want you to stand with me and we'll read together Romans chapter 1. I'll begin in verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of His Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now, at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now 
in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I've had among other Gentiles. I'm obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. That's why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. Verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Oh God, teach us now the essentials of godly ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. I want you to see that this jumps right off the page. In fact, it becomes incredibly easy to walk through and to outline because that's what Paul's telling them is I want you to know what is behind everything that I do. What is behind my love for God, my love for the gospel, my love for you. I want you to see my motives. And so the very first thing that you see there is that he says, first... I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. So Paul starts off by telling them that the number one essential of a godly ministry is thankfulness, is thankfulness. He is thankful for what God has done in him all throughout the New Testament. Paul gives his testimony over and over and over again. He spends a lifetime unable to get over that God saved him. And one of the things I think that we need to hear in this is that for some of you, you may have been saved for 5 years, 10 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. And to put it very bluntly, some of you are in danger of having gotten over the fact that God saved you. Some of you are not redeemed and you've never experienced the saving grace of God. But some of you listening are redeemed. You have given your life to Christ. You are a disciple. You have counted the cost. But there is a danger sometimes in taking that so for granted that some of you, if you're not careful, it may be that you cannot look back and remember the last time you were broken in thankfulness over the fact that God saved you. That you came to the point and you said, I just want to thank God. But Paul's thankful not only for what God's done in his life, but the key to godly ministry is he is thankful for what God's done in the lives of other people. He says, I thank God. God's moved in you so mightily that word about your testimony has spread all over the world and when we really have a godly ministry we're thankful not just for what God has done in our life but what God has done in the lives of others now I'll be honest over the course of recent days recent weeks recent months the devil is at work how many of you know that this is a real battle this this isn't playtime he is under spiritual attack prowling like a lion. He seeks to destroy you. He hates you. He wants to kill you. He wants to steal the opportunity for you to be saved. And for those of you that are saved, he wants to absolutely assault you on every front. This is not patty cake. This is spiritual warfare. There are powers and principalities involved for which you do not see. And there is a war for the souls of men. And I believe that one of the ways that he is waging that war in believers is to take away their thankfulness, to turn them bitter, to turn them angry, to turn them resentful, to look at situations and problems and epidemics and politics and things going on in the community. And before you know it, you don't remember the last time you actually thank God for what he's doing in your life and the life of other people. If thankfulness is not a regular, everyday, moment by moment, part of your life, then I can guarantee you, you, you're finding yourself now in a place of resentment. You found yourself in a place of bitterness, of anger, and there is no other antidote for a life of ministry than someone who is thankful for what God's doing in their life and the life of others. Are you someone who is committed to being thankful for what God has done in your life and the life of people in this church? We have a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot that needs to change. We have a lot of breakthroughs that need to happen. But while we're waiting on those, let's not forget to do what Paul said I did first. And that is I thank my God through Jesus Christ every time I remember you. But as he's thanking God, to thank God, you have to do something else. You can't thank God without the second element of godly ministry. And that is prayer. That is prayer. In verses 9 and 10, 
He calls on God as a witness. He said, God whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of His Son is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. Not only is thankfulness essential, but prayerfulness is essential. Prayerfulness is essential. It is the lifeblood of ministry. It is the lifeblood of spiritual vitality. It's, when I say ministry, l- let me clear this up because I, I see some of you that are looking at this. Every one of you is involved in ministry. You are a, not only a minister, but the church is involved in ministry. You're involved in ministry. If that term throws you, you could just say, what are the essentials of a godly life? If that would make it more applicable to you. If that question would help this to be more deep-seated into your heart. It's, it's not just thankfulness, but it's prayerfulness. And that prayer is an absolute essential element of a godly life. Prayer moves heaven, but more importantly, Prayer moves the will of man. It lines us up to what God desires. And for Paul, he understood that prayer was different than how prayer is being taught in modern day evangelical circles. So often today, and you've seen this, have you seen these people that they call it praying, but they command God to do certain things? God, I call on you, and you are going to do this, and I speak this, and I'm telling you that you are going to act, and you're going to move in this way. Fools and false prophets. And here is why. The goal of prayer is not that you would command God, but that God would command you. There's a large difference in that. And when we pray, yes, we come and beseech Him with our petitions and our requests, but our prayer is that His will be done and that our will collectively as a church and you individually would mold to His will. And then Paul in his prayerfulness. You see, some people will say, say, well, there's all we can do is pray about it as if that's a defeatist mentality. It's not all we can do about it. It's that we get to do something about it. But prayer formed Paul's theory on how he should also act. Watch this. If you look in the verse, not only does he say he's going to pray in my prayers at all times, and I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. Paul prayed, but Paul was also willing to be an answer to the prayer. Did you see that? He wants to come to them. I'm praying that I've got my bag packed. I'm ready to come to Rome. I'm ready to see you. Even though he's going to die there. You see, sometimes we pray about things, but here's how I know we're not sincere. Because we're not willing to be a part of the answer to the prayer. God provide this, God do this. And a lot of times God's looking at you and saying, the reason that you're even asking this is because it's on your mind and it's on your heart. And you have, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the ability to meet this need. You have the ability to witness to this person. You have the ability to get involved. So sometimes Paul understood there was a time to pray for it. But when God opened up the door, we don't keep praying. We move on the prayer that God has opened up. So be willing to pray, but be Be willing to be the answer to the prayer as well. That's the essential of godly ministry. Thankfulness, prayerfulness. And then watch with me in 11 through 13. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift. That's not mystical. When he says, I I desire to impart to you some spiritual gift... It wasn't that magically Paul was going to come and hit them with a wand and they all were going to get different abilities. What is the spiritual gift that Paul wants to impart to them? He already defines it in this passage. This this will help. What is the spiritual gift that he wants to impart to them? He said it just a moment ago. He wants to preach the gospel. Every time the gospel is preached, a spiritual gift is imparted. Paul wants to teach and preach. That's why he wants to go there, so that it will make you strong. That is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, that I've planned many times to come to you, but I've been prevented in order that I may have a harvest among you. You see, friends, not only is he thankful and prayerful, but he also has a genuine concern for these people. He really cared, and he wanted to be encouraged by them. Not only did he care about them, but I find it incredible that the Apostle Paul says, so that we can be mutually encouraged. 
Paul didn't just want to come to them so he could impart to them a spiritual gift by preaching to them. He wanted to come to them because he wanted to be encouraged by them. Do you know a key to getting out, to getting burnt out on life and getting burnt out on ministry is beginning to see everybody in your life as a burden? Think about that for a minute. When people, men, leave the pastorate, many times it is because they have begun to see the people that they are called to love as burdens. And sometimes in your own personal life, when you get down, when you get depressed, when you lose the excitement, when you lose the zeal, when you lose the passion, is because the people in your life, whether that's family, friends, people you go to church with, instead of seeing them as opportunities, you begin to see them as burdens. And for Paul, he wants to get there not just because he wants to preach to them, but because he wants to hang out with them and spend time with them because their stories are going to benefit him. That's why the fellowship of the unashamed is so important. Because we need each other. We need to care about people in a way that we understand that we want a genuine concern and know that we need other people. You see, I think sometimes we get disillusioned. Have any of you in here ever been hurt by another person? A couple of you? As you get older, that happens more often. I don't know an adult human being who has not been hurt by someone. But the problem is, every time we get hurt, if we're not careful, we develop emotional calluses on our soul. So the way we protect ourselves from that is we say, well, I'm not going to let anybody else get close because I'm not going to let anybody else hurt me. This isn't just about romantic relationships. This is about relationships in general so we don't let people get close at all so what happens is even though we build a little walled fort around our life you're never going to experience what God wanted you to experience because you're meant to be in relationship with other people and guess what some of them are going to disappoint you that's life but some of them aren't some of them are going to mutually encourage you and love you. And so because of that, we've got to do life together. It's why it's not just that we're unashamed. It's that there's a fellowship of the unashamed. There is a genuine concern for others. But third, third, verses 14 and 15, or fourth, excuse me, thankfulness, prayerfulness, genuine concern, and then number four, unwavering commitment. Paul says, I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, to wise and foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. There is an unwavering commitment, obligation to both Greeks and non-Greeks. Who is that? Well, you've got Jews, and then Paul's ministry is to the Gentiles. Of the Gentiles, you have the Greeks who were known as the, the learned, the, the cultured, the educated of the day. Some of your Bibles may have Greeks and barbarians in there. You may see that he is called to be a, a minister to both Greeks and barbarians. Paul is saying to the wise, to the educated, to those who are Greek, and to those who are non-Greek, who are non-cultured, uneducated. So what Paul is saying is there is a ministry to the Jews and there is a ministry to the Gentiles. And my ministry to the Gentiles is to Greeks and non-Greeks. It's to everyone. It's to everyone, Paul says. I have a ministry. But not only does he have this ministry to them, he understands that there are times when ministry is exciting, when ministry is full of joy and passion and excitement. And when Paul writes to them, he doesn't talk about that initially. He says, I am obligated. He uses the word there, obligated. And, and that word obligation means that whether or not I'm excited about it or not, I don't have a choice. When, you, if, when you're raising children, we've entered into a weird age of raising kids. I don't know if you noticed this. But 60 years ago, the way that we raise kids now was, is unheard of. Because we asked seven-year-olds their opinions. You know what I mean? Well, what would you like to do? Well, what would you like to eat? You don't want to go there? Well, we won't go there. We ask them their opinions, and, and we want to coddle that. But the issue here, when we're looking at way, the way Paul is addressing this, is 
he wants to be sure that they understand that when he is writing to them that there is an obligation that he doesn't have a choice. That God's called him and placed him on this and whether or not he was thrilled about it or not, it's what he has to do. And there are some people because in it seems like we have fostered the same way we raise kids with how we disciple those same kids as they get older in life. And we say, well, we just want to know if you'd like to do that. Would you be willing to do that? Would you be willing to serve? You're obligated. Do you understand that? You're obligated. If you have a voice and can sing, you ought to be singing. We ought not have to say, oh, we sure would appreciate it. It'd sure be great if you'd come. You know, we'll try to figure out what you like and, and try to figure out if there's some songs that you like and if they're perfectly in you. Forget that. If you can sing, you ought to join the choir. And if you have a rear end, you ought to attend church because if you can't do anything else, you can sit in the pew. Sometimes it's an obligation. If you're good with kids, God's giving you a gift. You ought to be teaching them. You ought to be actively involved with them. It, you should be with people and sharing the gospel. And sometimes it's about, oh, I can't wait. That's so excited. And sometimes it's because you've got a call on your life and you're living in disobedience when you don't follow the call that God's placed on your life. But for Paul, not only was he obligated, he was also eager. He said, that's why I'm so eager, verse 15, to come to you. There's passion and excitement and eagerness in his life. And what that translated was into action. You know, we live, we're still in, in a rural environment, obviously, here in southwest Mississippi. And sometimes you ask people if they've done something. Have, have they followed up on something? This isn't just ministry. Maybe it's something around their house that they've been meaning to get to or repair or there's or there, something they they're need to do. And they'll say something like this. They'll say, Pfft, I've been aiming to do that. You ever heard anybody say, I've been aiming to get to that. I, I've been aiming to get back there and get that done. I, I've, been, I've been aiming to go see him. Uh, I, I've been aiming to start serving at the church. I, I, I've been aiming to do that. Quit aiming. Start shooting. Right? Aim all the time. That's no fun. Shoot. Start doing something and doing it with an eagerness, with a passion, with an excitement. Action is what turns belief into faith. If you just believe some facts about Christianity, you don't have faith. Belief that moves, that's, that is faith. You can believe a lot of things and not have faith. But if you move on that belief, then you can know that you have faith. You're under obligation but I, I think maybe the best question we're going to ask in our time together is this question. Why would Paul want to preach the gospel to believers? He's already said that these are believers in Rome. But yet he said, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you. Why would he want to preach the gospel to believers? It is because the gospel is not just that you have a new life, but that Christ is your life. That the gospel is needed as much after justification as before you are justified. You need the gospel to get saved, but you need the gospel to get sanctified. And when we talk about the gospel, it's not that you need to hear it so that you can get saved. It is the power in every breath that you have. Are you preaching the gospel? Now some of you right now may be thinking immediately, I'm about to go to the unashamed part about witnessing. There ought to be not a day of your life that you do not preach the gospel to at least one person. Now watch this. Who's that one person? You. You ought to be daily preaching the gospel to yourself. Because it's the gospel that is the power in your life that got you saved, that sanctifies you, that will glorify you. And the gospel is not just my power to get my heaven's ticket card punched. The gospel is my ability to walk in faith and to believe. It's my power for living, my power for faith. It's my hope. It's my joy. And it's better news than all the drivel that most of you are listening to. We ought to be preaching the gospel to ourselves every day. And if we do that, then it will bring about verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. 
If I preach the gospel to myself, then I realize I am a member of FOTU, the fellowship of the unashamed, because I understand the power of the gospel. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. That's not in order of priority, that's in order of chronology, that it came first to the Jew, then it came to the Gentile. We all know that being ashamed is a sin, but it's a difficult sin to avoid. In sharing faith and in living life, fear of men and caring more for men's approval has made Christian cowards. And in an effort, this is what I see as a cancer in the church, a deep abiding scar that is festering in the life of the Christian church. We haven't told people to quit witnessing. We've told them to make the message more palatable. We've told preachers you can fill your churches up, but just make sure that when you share the gospel, you share the part about forgiveness, and you share the part about redemption, and you share the heart about hope, and you share the part about joy, and you share the part about heaven. And in individual witnessing, that's how we've taught people to witness. Just go out and tell them that God loves you. But it's an incomplete gospel. In fact, it's no gospel. Because An inoffensive gospel, here's a note for you, an inoffensive gospel is an inoperative gospel. And the reason that Paul had to even say that he wasn't ashamed was because when he preached the gospel, he didn't preach some Mickey Mouse version of I'm feeling good, you're feeling good, I'm okay, you're okay, Jesus is our buddy, let's get t-shirts and sing kumbaya and sit around a fire. His gospel was that the wrath of God is going to destroy your soul because you are a lawbreaker and a God-hater. And if you do not get right with God, hell will be your reward for all eternity for not being right with God. It's offensive. You say, but wait a minute, Larry. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The gospel's been my peace. The, the gospel is my joy. The gospel it is my hope. The gospel is everything good that I know. You're right. But it had to wreck you before any of that could be true. The gospel has to wreck you. And until we understand that as a church, we're not creating disciples. I don't know what we're creating. Some kind of little inoculated heathens that believe that they're saved, but grovel in their worldliness Because the grace that they have been told has been applied to their hearts has never been applied to their heart because they've never repented. You can't be saved if you haven't repented. Do you understand that, church? You can't be saved unless you repent. And for Paul, he understood that that was something that was difficult for people. And it still is. It shakes men at their core. It rocks people at who they are. Paul had been imprisoned in Philippi, chased out of Thessalonica, smuggled out of Berea, jeered at at Athens, regarded as a fool in Corinth, stoned in Galatia, and he headed to Rome where Christians were already being persecuted and he knew they would despise him and they would attempt to do him harm. Yet none of it, none of it curbed his boldness. None of it curbed his boldness because it was worth it. So he says that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. That word power, that Greek word dunamis, it is the only thing strong enough to save men from their sin and give them eternal life. Every other religion, every self-help strategy makes men feel better about themselves, but it has no transformative, redeeming power. Man does not have the power to change his own nature. But friends, I will tell you, if you are going to be one who is a member of this FOTU, the fellowship of the unashamed, then you need to know 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who do not believe. Foolishness to the lost. But to those who are being saved, it is the dunamis or the power of God. Do not be surprised when you are regarded as a fool. But because the way of salvation is foolishness 
The Ten Commandments are foolishness. Prayer is foolishness. God being supreme and authoritative is foolishness. Him being honored is foolishness. His rules for sexuality are foolishness. Everything about the Gospel is foolishness. If you are under some delusion that America is still a Christian nation, then wake up because you live now in a world that hates the Gospel. It hates the gospel. Not that flowery gospel that's preached in stadiums these days. Not the ones that tell you that God loves you no matter who you are or what religion you are or what you believe or how much you sin. It doesn't hate that gospel. It's never hated that gospel. The world has always loved that gospel because it's a false gospel. But if you're preaching an unashamed gospel that the wrath of God is only mitigated at the cross of Christ where His shed blood poured out as a covering over only to those who come and repent of their sins and beg a holy God to allow Jesus Christ to be the propitiation, the atonement for their sins so that he might die, that they might live. That's offensive. That's offensive. And the world hates that message. But Paul says in verse 17, here's why he's unashamed. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Your copy of Scripture may say from faith to faith. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. All who believe may be saved, but only those who truly believe will be saved. This righteousness, this word comes up 35 different times in the book of Romans alone. It is that God imparts His righteousness to believers It is 1 Corinthians 5.21 that he became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. But notice he says this, it is by faith from first to last that your justification is not just a one-time act, but it is a way of life, that it's not just belief in facts about Christ, but from faith to faith, or faith from first to last, that now it becomes a relationship of personally trusting Christ, and now it becomes everything about your life. I'm becoming increasingly convinced of the numbers of people who aren't true believers, even though they will tell you that they believe in Jesus. Even though they'll tell you that they believe He died on the cross and that He rose again. And they'll even tell you that they've asked Him to forgive them of their sins. But what you see in their life is no evidence that from faith to faith, from first to last, that He has become everything. You see, for Paul, that's a foreign gospel. If you're saved by the power of the gospel, it is so transformative, so revolutionary, that it now becomes everything to you. And if it doesn't, then you don't understand the gospel. You've missed the point of the gospel. So it says the righteous will live by faith. The very verse that revolutionized Martin Luther's life. That the righteous do not achieve it by their own morality or their own ability. But that the righteous will live by faith. And I want you to know that this is by faith. It's not by feeling. It's not by emotion. It's by making a conscious decision with the faculties of your mind. With the will of your heart. To move on what God has placed in your life that the righteous will live by faith. The difference in faith and belief, belief is knowing some facts. Faith is acting on the facts that you know. Have you acted on the facts of the gospel? Are you the righteous who have been covered by the blood of Jesus, who have accepted the foolishness of the cross, that it might become the power of God in your life? Are you a member of the FOTU, the fellowship of the unashamed? Are you who someone who is sitting weak-willed in the shadows of your faith, scared more of men than you have a fear of God? And it is a time for you to hit your knees and repent before a holy God, because if you are ashamed of him, he will be ashamed of you in front of his Father in heaven. It is time, church, to be a fellowship of the unashamed. It is time for you to get right. It's time for you to stand up. It's time for you to stand strong. It's time for you to be willing to act, 
to move, to witness, to believe, and to move from faith to faith, from first to last, embracing the call that God has placed on your life and realizing there is nothing more glorious than the call to be a disciple, a follower of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Would you stand with me?